Hey y'all, it's Brittany and welcome back. This week we are hopping into a new story in True Crime and Makeup. And this week's story is all about Miss Glenda Gale Furch. Now, this is a much lesser known story, but still worthy to be covered. Nonetheless, y'all know I love bringing you guys lesser known cases. So if you wanna learn all about this story, stay tuned. All right, you guys, so thank you as always for coming back for another installment of True Crime and Makeup. I really enjoy the engagement with y'all in these comments down below. It has been so fun to go back and forth with you guys. I greatly appreciate all of the support from you guys, all of the suggestions from you guys. And this is actually another story from one of you. So thank you, my busy bees, for supporting me. To everybody who subscribed, we are growing, y'all. Now, for those of you who are just finding my channel, welcome, sis, welcome, sir. Please make sure you subscribe. You don't wanna miss these videos. I do true crime and makeup. I also do Snapped in Skincare, also known as Clean Skin Dirty Deeds and a bunch of other stuff. I do wigs and protective hairstyles and fragrances, which are two other things that I really do enjoy and I love sharing with you guys outside of true crime and makeup. So make sure you subscribe so that you get all of those goodies. Also make sure y'all hit that notification bell so that you get notified whenever I post new content. But let's hop into the story of Glenda Furch. Another quick thing that I just wanted to throw in really quickly was this week's makeup will be really focused on more affordable options. Some of you in the comments have been asking me to use more affordable stuff. So I really tried to go through my stash and find the more affordable stuff, stuff that's more accessible, some things you may be able to find in drugstores or Target, or even if it's in Sephora or Ulta, it's on the cheaper end of the price points there. So that's what I'm really focusing on this week. And I'll be trying out actually a new CoverGirl product, two new CoverGirl products that I'll talk to you guys about at the end. But I plan on doing a strictly best-selling drugstore video of True Crime and Makeup maybe next week. I wanna make sure I get all my research down and get the best products for y'all. So be on the lookout for that. But let's get into this story. Glenda Furch was born on June 7th of 1965, and she was living in Fort Worth, Texas, and she was living alone. She was a mother of two daughters, and she was also a grandmother, and she was a very strong, devout, church-going woman. At the time, she was single. She was not dating anybody, no one was aware of her dating anybody, but she was also a very personal and very private person. But she was really, really into church. And so much, in fact, that whenever she would miss a Sunday at church or she was expecting not to be at something that she felt like she should have been at a church, she would call her pastor and she would apologize and say, you know, I'm sorry, I am not gonna be able to make it. And that's how important that piece of her life was to her. Now, Glenda had been a assembly line worker at General Motors in nearby Arlington, Texas, and she had been there for 17 years. So that was her career. And in 1987, she had actually moved to the apartments that she was staying at, which was the Hidden Valley Estates. And that's where she resided for pretty much as long as that career. Now, a few weeks before anything took place, Glenda had called the police and she had reported kind of some strange behavior at her door, a strange individual, and she felt unsafe is what she told the dispatcher when she called the police. It was basically begging for Glenda to let him in. And when she asked why, and she kept saying, no, thank you, not interested. He kept saying, you know, please, please, let me just show you something. Let me just show you something. And it was really strange to her. And she actually told police that she felt threatened in that moment. So something that I just wanted to call out because the days leading up to what actually happened to Glenda, she was uneasy in those few weeks prior. Now, one Sunday on October 1st of 2007, 
Glenda did not show up for church. And she also didn't call her pastor as she usually would have to let him know that she was not going to make it. Now, when Glenda didn't show up for church, her daughter immediately thought to go and check on her. It was unusual for her mom not to show up for church and not to say anything about it. Now, when the daughter went to check on Glenda, because she did not show up for church and they had not heard from her, she got there and her car was gone. Glenda's car was gone and her door was locked. So it didn't seem like there was anything going on that they should have been worried about at the time. So when the daughter actually went into her mom's apartment, she had a key, she went into the apartment and when she went into the apartment, it was unusually hot. Her daughter had said that her mom never let it get hot in her house. She loved the air. She kept the air conditioner running and it was weirdly hot. It was weirdly hot in her house. But other than that, nothing really seemed like it was out of place or anything. She didn't notice anything. So she figured, well, maybe mom just decided she wanted to go somewhere for a few days to get away or something and she'll be back. So she locked her mom's apartment and she left. But now when she did not show up for work on that Monday at GM, they knew something was wrong. She never missed work and didn't give a reason, call off. She was never a no call, no show. So they contacted police and reported Glenda missing. Now when police end up going to check and see what was going on at Glenda's apartment, they come back and miraculously her air is back on. Now, in addition to noticing that her air has been turned back on, they also noticed there's some other signs of foul play in Glenda's apartment. Now, when police go in, they notice that there is a bleach stain on the floor in Glenda's bedroom next to her bed. Now, her daughter said when she went in, she didn't notice any bleach stain, any bleach smell at all. And it felt like that was definitely something that she felt like she would have noticed if it was there at the time when she went in. Now, police also noticed that her garbage can, her vacuum cleaner, all of that is missing from her apartment. Just, it's just gone. Now, police take samples of that bleach stain that they found in her apartment, in her bedroom, and they test the stain to see if there's any bodily fluids, blood, any of that in this area in the carpet. And they actually don't find anything. Now, police also find that all of the surfaces in her apartment have been completely wiped down, sanitized 100%. I'm talking about the light switches, the handles on the doors, the doorknobs, even down to the faucets. Everything has been completely wiped down. They couldn't find any fingerprints anywhere in her apartment. Now, police also talk to her employer, GM, and they find out that, you know, she was at work on that previous Thursday. So September 28th, she was at work and she did work the night shift, so she got off around midnight. Now, right after she left work, she stopped to get gas and police find that she used her credit card. So we know that she used that credit card after work and she was not taken from work. Now, neighbors tell police that on Monday morning, they saw a black male around 2 a.m. Monday morning, going in and out of Glenda's apartment from the parking lot in her car to her apartment. And they also saw him in her car going in and out of the actual parking lot, leaving and coming back, leaving and coming back. And it just really looks like he was getting rid of stuff. Now, as soon as police hear this from the neighbors, they go and check the dumpsters and they check those dumpsters just in the nick of time. I'm gonna put on my magnetic lashes and I'll be right back. 
When police check the actual dumpster nearby her apartment, they find a whole lot of stuff, y'all. But first of all, what they find is the receipt from the gas station where Glenda stopped after she got off of work. So at the very least, we know that Glenda made it home. They find a total of five bags in this dumpster. And along with that receipt telling us that Glenda made it home, they find a bunch of empty cleaning supply containers. So empty bleach bottles, you name it, they found it. They found some towels that were thrown out. They found some duct tape that was used and also an unused roll of duct tape was all in that garbage as well. Now what we also find is a shirt from Glenda and it's later identified by her daughters that it's hers and also by DNA that it's hers. But they find a shirt that has been cut up the back in that dumpster as well. The only thing that was missing from inside the home was Glenda's gun. In addition to her vacuum and her garbage can, her gun was also missing. And again, there were no fingerprints for police to go off of, so they were really at a loss at that point. So whoever did this crime was a CSI stan, okay? Because all of the cleanup seemed to be on point. We'll find out, maybe not but at least he thought he was on point. Now, about five days later, there was a report of an abandoned car at a abandoned car wash that was about 30 miles away from Glenda's apartment. So when police go to check out this car that's burning, they finally get the fire out and they see that luckily there is no one inside of the burning car. But what they are able to confirm from the VIN number still being there is that the car belongs to Glenda Furch. Now, while police are doing their investigation and their due diligence, the family is also out there working. They are out there passing out flyers, talking to the media, doing whatever they can to keep Glenda's name at the top of mind for everyone in the community. Now, while all of this is happening, there was a report of a black female whose body was found wrapped in a blue floral comforter and then tied up with electrical cord. Now we know that Glenda had a similar comforter in her home, in her bedroom that was missing from her apartment. We also know that electrical cord was found in that dumpster with all of Glenda's belongings and the evidence that tells us that Glenda made it home after her shift on the night of the 28th. But when police and the Emmy check dental records, they are able to confirm that it is not Glenda Furch that was found wrapped up in that blue floral comforter. On October 29th, so about a month after Glenda was last seen, police are kind of just riding around and they notice a man who is moving things out of a car and going back and forth. Whatever was going on, it seemed very strange to police officers. So when police officers run the car plates, they find out that this car is a stolen vehicle. So when they move in to arrest the person who's moving stuff in and out of this car's trunk, he hops in the car and he takes off and he leads them on a high speed chase on a freeway for 25 minutes, 25 whole minutes. And then he eventually flips the car. And when he flips the car, he lives and he is taken into custody. This man's name is Rodney Owens and he's 40 years old at this time. Now, Rodney Owens was a unemployed career criminal. He had tried his hand at being in the military and ended up being dishonorably discharged from the military because of a number of assault charges that he had. Now, he also had a few warrants because of his abuse and assault on his ex-girlfriend. Now his ex-girlfriend had told police that he had threatened her that he was going to put a garbage bag or a plastic bag over her head and he was going to watch her suffocate. And he threatened to kill her a number of times. This was not the only time. But they had been together for about 12 years 
and this violence just went on and on and on. Police also find out that Rodney used to live with his mom right across from Glenda Furch's apartment in the next apartment building. So he lived in the same apartment complex as Glenda did. When police search the car that he actually crashed, police find some valuable evidence in that car pertaining to Glenda's case. What they actually find is they find duct tape and they find the brand of duct tape that was actually used and found in that dumpster near Glenda's apartment building. And this was unique because this wasn't like your standard duct tape that we all buy. It was a specific brand of duct tape. I think it was called like tape it duct tape, but it was only sold in a very small amount of like local stores at the time. Now in this duffel bag that they find in the car that he flipped, the stolen vehicle, they also find the same electrical cords in that bag that they found in the dumpster near Glenda's apartment as well. And that electrical cord also had the same type of knots in it that the one in the dumpster did as well. They also found a gun and a knife in the bag in the car as well. So police get real CSI themselves and they take the roll of duct tape and they do kind of like the super glue test. I don't know if you've seen it, if you watch CSI or forensic files or anything like that. The super glue test is kind of where they, they use super glue to identify any type of impressions or fingerprints or anything like that on a piece of evidence. So they run this test on the roll of duct tape that they found in the dumpster. Now they have Rodney Owens in custody on different warrants. So they already have his DNA. They already have his fingerprints. And when they run that test on the duct tape roll, they find a fingerprint on it. They also run tests on some of the other things that were found in that dumpster as well, in those bags. So we know that they all came from the same place. There were some cans in there as well and they find a fingerprint on a can as well. So they take both of those fingerprints that they get from the testing and they compare it against Rodney Owens fingerprints and sis, it's a match. Now, in terms of DNA testing in that dumpster bag, they found, like I said before, they found some towels, some bath towels that actually matched the type of bath towels and the color of bath towels that Glenda had in her apartment. So they ran a DNA test on some semen that they had found on these towels that were in the dumpster. And they compared that along with the cans that had the fingerprint on it. They tested those for DNA as well. And they tested those and ran those against, again, Rodney's DNA. And it was confirmed that that was his DNA as well. Now, also while in prison, he kind of slipped up and started talking. I guess he was bored. I don't know y'all, but he started telling a particular inmate like, yeah, he did it. He, Glenda was the perfect target because he knew her habits. He lived right across from her. He knew that she worked late at night, the night shift. He knew that she lived alone and she drove a nice car. So he felt like she would have a lot of money and she'd be a good person to rob. So basically what police thinks happened at this point is that they think that Rodney pretty much forced Glenda to let him inside the apartment with some type of weapon, probably a gun. And he tied her up with the duct tape and the electrical cord and then proceeded to sexually assault her. Once he did that, he killed her. Then he took her bed sheets, her comforter, wrapped her up and tied her up with the electrical cord and took her body and put her in her own car and basically just drove away. They then think that he came back to the apartment Sunday night after Glenda's daughter had already come to check on her and turned the air back on because it was hot in there and proceeded to do his CSI cleanup, bleached everything, vacuumed everything, wiped down everything, and got rid of everything that he thought would be evidence. What he didn't think about is that the garbage didn't come until later on Monday. So if the family felt like she was missing and called the police and the police got there in enough time, that evidence would have still been there. 
And thank God for active family members and a police unit that actually does their job. Now let's talk about the trial. So the trial took place in October of 2008, so a year after Glenda actually went missing. And it only lasted for a total of two days. Now the prosecutor called about 30 witnesses and the defense called zero, zero witnesses. Now, one of the prosecution's main witnesses was Rodney's ex-girlfriend, and her name was Nakisha Baldwin, and she basically testified to how horrible of a person he was. They were together for 12 years, and they had a son together, and he was pretty much always violent towards her. He had threatened her a number of times. He had threatened her with a shotgun to her face, and he stalked her constantly it got to a point where he had tried to ram her car and he ended up totaling one of the cars and really really heavily damaging the other car it just never ended he also threatened her family especially her grandmother who helped out with their kid quite a bit he would threaten that he would run her over while she was walking the children to school just all types of crazy. After they broke up, Nikisha had also started to date one of her co-workers at the time by the name of Reggie. And obviously when Rodney found out about that, he was not happy to say the least because what's his was his, it belonged to him, nobody else, right? So he tried the same ramming tech tactic with Reggie and basically followed him after work one day because he knew he where he worked, he worked with his ex-girlfriend and rammed his car as well, trying to scare him. He later threatened him at gunpoint, telling him to stay away from Keisha and if he didn't, then that would be that. Obviously, Reggie already knew what was up, so Reggie already had his own gun and pulled his gun on Rodney and that proceeded to have Rodney leave the scene. Now, she also said that he would promise and promise that he would change when they were together, but he never changed, obviously. Now, the defense's argument was basically that there was no body, so you can't prove that Glenda was actually dead. They also tried to argue that there was no actual physical evidence inside her apartment that proved that Rodney was ever in the apartment. But nobody was trying to hear that. None of the jury bought that whatsoever. And he was actually convicted of murder. He was convicted of the murder of Glenda Furch and he was given a life sentence. Now, they had offered him a lighter sentence if he would give the family the location of Glenda so that the family could have closure and he was not going for it. He refused to give them any type of information to be able to locate Glenda's body. So he was hit with the life sentence. Now, two years after that, he was also convicted of another assault case and was given 99 years that he needs to serve consecutively. That means one after another of the current sentence that he already had. So at this point, he needs to serve at least 60 years before he can even be eligible for parole. And by my calculations, if he was 41 at the time of conviction, he, he's not getting out. All right, y'all, so this is the final look. And in terms of what happened to Rodney Owens, I saw a few posts on Reddit saying that he had died in 2015. So I'm assuming he died in prison. I couldn't find anything to confirm that in terms of like news articles or anything. But again, it may be just such a lesser known case that they didn't bother to report on his death. I did try to look him up in the inmate database for Texas and his information was not in there. So I'm assuming he is deceased. Now, something else that's very special about this case, this was the first case in Tarrant County, Texas, where someone was actually convicted for murder without finding the body. No body, still convicted. So it can be done. But in terms of the look, like I said in the beginning, I tried my best to use very accessible and very affordably priced 
items today. I will leave the entire list of the items that I used today in the description box down below as I always do. But two items that I did wanna highlight today were two new items from CoverGirl. So the first one being the CoverGirl Outlast Extreme Wear Concealer. And this says it's a 24 hour full coverage concealer. And the color that I used was in Warm Tawny. And this color, I think it was just the wrong color choice. I got these from Influencer. If you don't know what it is, check it out. But these are two items that are gonna be launching soon. And I think the color that I got was just a little too yellow, a little too golden of an undertone when I have a pink undertone. So looks a little yellow under the eye, but it is a great concealer. I am not gonna lie about that. It does cover, honey, it covers. The only downside, and I don't even know if it's a downside, but the only caveat with this one is that as soon as you apply it, baby, you gotta move it to where you want it. Because I had to spritz my face a few times with a mist to rehydrate this product so that I could get it to move to where I wanted it to be. So as soon as you apply this, move it and it sets. You don't really need a powder to set this. I used a light powder anyway. I did not bake whatsoever, but I used a light, a light powder for this and it, it it's not going anywhere. That's for sure. I think I wanna see if I can get this. Once it does launch, I wanna see if I can get it in a color that has my undertone to it because I really like it. I really think it's great for like quick faces, especially when you're trying to just boom, boom, cover up the blemishes, add a little shimmer and keep it moving. This would be great for that. The other product that I got from CoverGirl that's gonna be launching is the Outlast Extreme Powder. It's the Outlast Extreme Express powder and I went for a very minimal look today. So I kind of use this as like a powder foundation. It has enough coverage, it's full coverage. So it has enough coverage to be used as a foundation. It looks just like my skin. This was the perfect match. I was a little apprehensive at first because it does look lighter than my skin tone but when I applied it it was a perfect match so it just looks like my skin but better it's giving me matte but natural matte like I don't look super dry I still have some shine to my face I also added a very affordable highlighting balm underneath so you see that glow without having to put any highlighter on top of that, no highlighter was applied. But this product, I really like this. Again, these would be really good for a quick face when you're just trying to keep it clean, keep it cute and push. I really like this so far. I will see if it actually lasts. It says this one is 16 hours instead of the 24 of the concealer. But I, I think it will last. It doesn't feel tight. It doesn't feel drying on my skin. So I'm hopeful that this will last and it'll be a good kind of go-to everyday quick fix for me. But we'll see. I am always down for a good drugstore if it works. My problem is I don't have a shade usually in drugstore, so I can't really gravitate towards drugstore products. So I tend to have to spend the money on more expensive products. But I'm happy with these two. I'm surprisingly happy with these two. Let me know if you've tried the liquid version of it as well and what your thoughts are on it. This gave me a very beautiful finish. Beautiful, buffed, kind of flawless skin finish. And I'm here for it. I will take it from drugstore, okay? But other than that, y'all, it has been fun. I really enjoyed sharing a lesser known case with you guys. Again, I like to shed light on those cases because those victims' names deserve to be spoken just as with those bigger name cases. So happy to shed some light on more of these cases. I do also plan on doing more of the unsolved cases, especially for those who don't get enough media coverage to help with the case. Even though my platform is small, I want to use it any way that I can. So I will continue to share those cases as well. So be on the lookout for those. But otherwise y'all, until next time, love you guys. Bye.